Okay. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I know a few people are still attending, but I think we'll, we'll kick off for the purposes of time. So uh, thank you for joining us on our second uh, COVID-19 business continuity planning webinar. Um, the aim is, is to provide some updates uh, on this, uh, this ever-moving feast. Um, and so today uh, I'm going to cover some updates on the uh, job retention scheme from the government. Uh, then I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Greg Taylor, who's going to cover funding and then uh, hand over to Alison Horner, who's going to cover uh, PA, uh, tax deferrals. Uh, and then uh, we're on hand, obviously, for any uh, questions that people want to pose uh, as we're live as well. So without further ado, just to uh, just provide an update. Um, we, uh, so since the last webinar, um, the government issued um, some updated guidance on the job retention scheme uh, on Saturday morning. Um, so very kind of them to send some stuff through at 20 past nine while I was trying to do some stuff in the garden. But, um, but it was quite welcome uh, information that they've sent through. And they have clarified a few uh, burning issues that, that people weren't sure about. The first and most important um, is a call of action to any employer who isn't currently enrolled for PAYE online. Um, you need to be enrolled for PAYE online in your own right. So you may have... A, a accountants and agents who submit your payroll for you that will not necessarily count as your online um, uh, enrollment make sure you've got your own uh, and it can take up to 10 days for that to happen so so get onto that it's a really simple process go through the government gateway get yourself enrolled for PAYE online there's no downside to that but it is therefore likely to be one of the criteria um, when the uh, claim furlough claims grant claims go into the government but they will look to see if they can match you on their online system. So if they can't, that's going to be a bit of a blocker on payments coming back to you. And secondly, um, they're also, uh, I imagine, going to check that those individuals you put a grant claim in for on the new portal will also uh, be on your payroll um, with the submission that was sent in at the end of February. Now, that submission probably went in from your agent if you haven't got your own online um, uh, Login, that, that's okay, don't worry about that, but just make sure that you've got your on, online enrolment for the purposes of then processing the furlough grant claims and getting your money back. So you run your payroll as normal, there's no change how you run your payroll, but this is about getting the money back. I've literally just before we came on the call had an up, uh, update from, uh, from the government, uh, from HMRC, saying that they expect to release the portal on the 20th of April. So the ability to go on and register on that online portal should open on the 20th of April. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the initial claims um, can start to go in. Um, so that's, uh, that's good news. It's better than we thought. We thought it would be right at the end of April before the portal would be available. But it looks like um, they are, as they say, pulling out all of the stops to help you to get the money back, get money back into your bank accounts. Um, the money won't be immediate. So, so Greg's section is still very, very relevant that you're going to need to think about how do you fund through on the pay and reclaim um, because, uh, you know, it still might take a few weeks for the money to physically hit your bank account. You've got to make sure that obviously you, you've got cash flow through that period and you may well also be paying April payroll um, before you get the money back in relation to any furlough claim for, for March or the first part of April. So this cash flow is still going to be really key because this is a grant, so you pay and reclaim it. Some of the things they've clarified is that um, apprentices, apprentices can be furloughed, same as any other employees. Um, and individuals, um, if you are in a situation where you actually, uh, as an individual, engage a nanny, um, they will be. Uh, able to be furloughed. Originally, the view was they wouldn't because you're not a business necessarily, but the government have said yes, we'll, we'll allow that for, for nanny uh, PAY schemes as well. Um, you can uh, you furlough anybody who's on a fixed term contract. That fixed term contract may actually come to an end during this furlough period, um, but you can renew them and extend them and continue to furlough those people who may be on a fixed term contract. Those people that are shielding, so if, you're shield, if they're shielding in line with public health guidance, so not because they're ill or they're self-isolating or they've got symptoms, but just because they're shielding, because the government guidelines say they should shield, they can be furloughed too. So again, they will be people who are at home shielding, doing no work, 
but they would qualify to be furloughed employees as well. Um, employees obviously could be furloughed, as can office holders, which includes company directors, salaried members of limited liability partnerships, agency workers, including those that work through an umbrella company, and LIMBY workers, so our delivery riders, etc. All of those, all of those individuals would qualify as qualifying employees to be furloughed. Directors, however, um, can only carry out statutory duties. So the rule that says that people can do no work while they're furloughed still follows. Obviously, for a, for a director, there may be some statutory things that they have to do, um, but that would be very, very limited. So filing your accounts or doing things with company's house uh, certainly will be okay. Anything outside of that would be quite difficult. Um, you must have informed the employees individually in writing that they're being furloughed. So if you haven't done that already, you need to do that. Um, ideally, they, want, they should be agreeing to that and sending you an agreement form back. And that then is your record. You keep that record on file for up to five years. So that gives you an idea that when this is audited, after, after we're through all of this, um, that HMRC will be taking up to five years to do audits and check you've done the right things with the documentation, with the right people, with the right amounts, uh, and obviously clawing back where you haven't done that. Um, so it doesn't matter if you've already furloughed somebody because you, the furlough claim um, can apply from the time that they were actually furloughed. Um, not when you were thinking about it or not when you notified or, or when you agreed to them. So you can do this, uh, do these letters um, essentially retrospectively um, and that won't affect your furlough grant claim at the moment. But if these letters aren't, aren't on file and they're not properly done, uh, then that could affect your claim going forward um, or any reclaim from the government. Um, they have now clarified, so previously there was a section that said salaried employees can only receive, um, or you can only receive a furlough grant reclaim for salaried employees on their base salary. And that excluded at that stage fees, commissions and bonuses. They've now removed the line that says it, it excludes fees, commissions and bonuses. So the reference period is still the 28th of February because they don't want people uplifting their March salary in relation to furlough grant claims. So you use the reference point for salaried and you use all regular payments. So any regular payment for a salaried person that was in their February uh, pay um, would qualify for the furlough grant reclaim. Um, anybody who isn't salaried, um, nothing's changed. It's still the calculation is either based on the higher of what they received in the previous period last year. So for April, what did they receive in April 19 pay um, or the average over the tax year, April 2019 to 2020. There is still a bit of confusion in relation to, say, commissions. So anything that was regular and therefore what's termed to be compulsory. So regular commissions people receive every month can be included in those calculations. But anything that was uh, that was not compulsory um, and therefore discretionary, so such as one off bonuses, annual bonuses, perhaps um, they shouldn't be included. But anything else that was regular. So any other regular monthly fees, overtime, commission bonuses can be included in the calculation to get to the 80 percent furlough pay with the two and a half thousand pounds a month cap that could be reclaimed by employers. It isn't clear yet <clears throat> whether for a salaried person you would look to use the base salary for February and maybe the average commissions over the year. Um, that is something that's being clarified but um, what is clear for salaried people you can use what went through the payroll in February um, as a minimum. Um, the grant will be pro rata so you can obviously claim for an employee um, if they're only furloughed for part of a pay period. Um, uh, they clarified that, but I don't think it needed any clarity. I think there was an expectation that, that that's what would happen. But the employee still needs to be furloughed for a minimum of three weeks. Um, you can rotate people, employees on, on and off furlough, um, but that needs to be for a minimum three-week period at a time. Um, claims... Uh, can be started from, from the time somebody finishes work, which I said, um, and all the regular payments. Um, the furlough grant claim does not include anything that went through payroll that was benefit in kind or salary sacrifice related. 
But what the HMRC have said is that COVID-19 is a lifestyle event. So therefore you can make changes with employees agreement to their salary sacrifice arrangements um, uh, because of because of COVID-19. So that might help them going forward. Um, they might have more net pay to take home if you adjust some of their salary sacrifice arrangements during this period of time. So that's a lifestyle event that helps you to make a change um, for existing things that are through salary sacrifice. Um, and therefore, um, one would expect it's a lifestyle event when we're through the other side of this um, so that you can perhaps reverse back to, to where you were um, after, the, after that date. Um, if you are contractually, if contractually allowed, your employees you can allow your employees who are furloughed to work for somebody else so not just voluntary work um, clearly they're only allowed while they're furloughed to do voluntary work for you or training so nothing that provides services or makes money for your business so so pretty much not very much at all but they can do voluntary work for other people and now they can also do paid work for other people so you may furlough somebody um, and they would also be allowed to go and get a new job perhaps um, doing some picking and packing at Tesco's um, other supermarkets uh, are available um, so that they can um, get some some other money from somewhere else even while they're furloughed and working um, for for you um, so those are the those are the things that that are updated that were um, that were that were certain on um, some other things that um, are either unclear or, or just haven't been addressed um, anybody who started for you after the 28th of February there's still no movement they um, they, they just can't be furloughed um, obviously anybody who there's still no change to anybody who left you um, between say the 28th of February and the 20th of March when when the furlough grant scheme was announced you can re-engage them um, obviously all sorts of employment law considerations if you were to re-engage somebody that had left or um, or you'd made redundant. Um, but anybody that started for you after the 28th of February and, and, by, and by virtue of not being on the February payroll um, can't be included in a furlough grant claim, no change on that. Um, holidays and bank holidays are still uh, to be clarified. Um, the government advice uh, refers everybody to ACAS and ACAS reverse, reverts everybody back to the government. So it's really unclear if during the furlough period, if people, um, which will cover bank holidays, clearly, um, and maybe some areas where individuals take um, take holiday, annual leave, whether that's payable to them at 100%, but you can only reclaim 80%, or whether it's payable to them at only the 80% rate, um, that it's just not covered at the moment, and uh, everybody is batting away um, the answer to that one. And the other thing is the expectation is that um, if there were a transaction during the period and people have 2 P'd across, so they were on the payroll for one employer on the 28th of February, and now they've 2 P'd to a new employer, um, and therefore they're only on that payroll from March, um, those still seem to fall outside um, of qualifying at the new employer to be um, within the furlough grant claim, even though... Um, their continuity of service obviously is protected by 2P um, and it's as if they, they hadn't changed jobs. Um, at the moment that still appears to fall outside of what's covered by the Job Retention Scheme grant claim. So um, those, those are the updates. Um, clearly we're getting them pretty much weekly, um, sometimes daily. Uh, we will continue to, uh, to, to update people as and when um, some of these unknown areas are clarified or, or, or some of the ambiguities cleared um, but that's the latest update um, so I'll perhaps hand over now to to Greg to give you a, a bit of an update on funding. Thanks Nigel. Uh, afternoon everybody. Uh, trust everybody is uh, heading towards the weekend as well. Um, just to give you an update on where we are in regards to the Siebel scheme and obviously there was an announcement towards the end of last week as well about a larger scheme so to start off with, so the, the, the SME scheme, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, uh, so that is for businesses with a turnover of up to 45 million. There's been a few changes clarified uh, by Rishi Sunak on that one. So let's start with those. So number one, personal guarantees cannot be taken for any facilities below 250,000 now. That's across all 40 funders that were on the scheme. 
uh, are approved to, to uh, lend under the scheme. Uh, insufficient security is no longer a condition of access to the scheme. So whereas uh, before uh, there was a security requirement where if you had additional security, it could be used to, to use uh, to fund on a normal commercial basis, that is no longer applicable. Uh, so you can go straight to the scheme. Uh, personal guarantees may be required facilities above 250,000. That's at the lender's discretion. So each lender will have a different criteria and security package that they require, depending upon the amount borrowed and the risk reward perceived within the application. Uh, but these are now capped at 20% of the outstanding balance after business asset recoveries. Um, and lenders uh, to retrospectively apply charges, that doesn't apply to, that's more the lender criteria. Um, and then moving on, so what then happened was there was then an announcement which initially was pretty unclear as to exactly what this, uh, was it a new scheme, was it a, a revision and an expanding of the Siebel scheme, uh, but it is in fact a new scheme. Uh, there's very little details at this point, but we're hoping for some more towards the end of this week, maybe tomorrow, certainly early next week, <coughs> excuse me whereby um, the new scheme is called the Coronavirus Large Business Interruption Loan Scheme, the CL bills, you can see the variation on the theme there. Uh, and this provides, again, an 80% uh, guarantee from the government to the banks of, for making loans of up to £25 million available to businesses, with an annual turnover of between 45 and £500 million turnover. So, that mostly came around, as a lot of you will realise, because there were lots of businesses at this larger end of the scale falling between the cracks, between the old scheme, this the original Siebel scheme, and the higher scheme, which was the CCFF, the Corporate Finance Cash Flow Scheme, uh, whereby I think only 100 businesses from research that we've seen actually had the short-term investment grade rating uh, to fall under that scheme. So this is, a, this is an entirely new scheme. We expect it to be offered... Uh, by the banks, uh, and it'll be, it'll be incumbent on the banks to lend. Uh, the loans will be backed by the government uh, and offered at com commercial rates of interest, but it is understood, and again, this is obviously subject to change, but at the moment it is understood from our conversations with the British Business Bank that the government will not cover interest or fees in the same way as the smaller business scheme. So it's unlikely at this point that there will be an interest-free period as there is with the smaller scheme, which is currently at a 12-month period, uh, where the government are actually paying the interest. It's not deferred, it's physically paid um, on the smaller scheme. So you then can move still to the CCFF, which is the much larger scheme, which is a short-term buying of commercial paper. But again, you know, only roughly, as we've already said, circa 100 businesses will qualify that scheme effectively it is there, but has been made redundant when we have more details on this coronavirus large business interruption loan scheme, then we will share them with you um, around how to apply, which is more likely going to be back to your high street bank. Um, but equally, what information is required? We now, um, in terms of McIntyre Hudson, have a very good understanding on, on our side of the fence as to what the banks are looking for. Um, how you should be putting your applications together, certainly business planning and all that sort of stuff that I know a lot of you would have been doing will remain critical um, and in, as part of your application, but also covering off a lot of questions around COVID-19, how has it affected your business? How do you see the business coming back out of this? Under, helping the bank to understand the run through of your sales channels, what is sold, how is it invoiced, when do customers pay, and how that will, how you think that will pick up uh, post COVID nineteen? Clearly, you know we're all going to have a lot of questions around. Well, I don't have a crystal ball. No, neither do we. Neither does the bank. But we need to give our best uh, guesstimation as to what that's going to look like. Uh, because from a bank point of view, they want, but they need to be able to look back in 12, 18, 24 months time and say, making a lending decision with the information we had available this was the best lending decision that we could have made. Um, so I think that's, that's certainly something that we need to, 
we would be happy to help anybody with if you want some uh, some sort of guidance around what to put together. Uh, and certainly I would be saying, you know, you should still be carrying on supplying to your bank uh, your monthly pack of information if you have borrowing facilities currently. Don't stop producing management accounts. Um, carry on producing them and sending them across. Um, another one quickly as well I wanted to pick up on is financial support for exporters. So if you are an exporter or you do export a, a some amount of goods, then clearly you'll be aware of UK Export Finance, I hope, UKEF. The website is really good and there is specific help in, in respect to COVID-19 for exporters around uh, certain facilities for uh, facing disruption or late payment. There's an export working capital scheme. Uh, also for getting paid and helping to recover cost of fulfillment. Uh, there's an export insurance policy, a direct lending scheme facilities, uh, and also 4 billion of capacity to support UK export firms uh, exporting to China. Do please check out the uh, UK EF website for full details of what you can do and what you may be eligible for in terms of that. Moving away from the government schemes, clearly you know, there are still lenders out there that are lending on a commercial basis. So if you do get turned down on a Siebel's application or on the higher scheme at some point, again, we'd be delighted to, to have a look at it and just judge from, from our experience, our professional experience, whether you have a, a, a case that we can take back and appeal to the bank uh, or whether there may be some other form of finance that potentially we can direct you towards uh, to try and help you get through these difficult times. They are difficult for everybody uh, and we want to make sure that we can get as many people through the other side of this uh, all together as we can. Um, so if we can help, we'd like to, we'd like to do so. Uh, happy to take uh, any questions, but with that, I'll hand over to, uh, to Alison. Thanks, Greg. And um, just to recap everybody about VAT deferrals, as you know, um, there is the automatic deferral for any business that is on a 02, 03 or 04 VAT return. So that VAT return has to be submitted and you need to pay back the VAT amount to HMRC by the 31st of March 2021. So whilst everybody is waiting and hoping to get all their funding sorted, this represents a really good cash flow and um, benefit for all that registered businesses. And um, what happens if you can't submit your return? We've had this question a lot and the temptation is to, to not submit the return at all. Um, but obviously to get the benefit of that cash flow and to get the automatic deferral, you need to submit that VAT return. Now, in exceptional circumstances, HMRC allow businesses to submit an estimated return, but it is necessary for the business to um, get permission from HMRC before they're, before they're able to do that. We've had a few calls with HMRC and found that they're strangely resistant to this, and we don't think that's at least correct. So what we are recommending to businesses who genuinely cannot get their VAT return in on time because they can't get into the office, because their staff are furloughed, etc., we do recommend that you contact HMRC either by web chat, keep the reference number, um, and keep a, obviously a screen print of your conversation with HMRC, or by, um, by writing to them to tell them that you are intending to submit, you are going to be submitting an estimated return and that you will correct the differences on your next VAT return after this period. So as with everything to do with these deferrals, you really must make sure that you do this before the due date that your VAT return um, is due to be submitted. Moving on to a little bit of comment about import VAT because we've had various questions about import VAT because as people who import will know there's a really big payment up front in order to get your, your goods cleared through customs. For those businesses who've got a duty deferment account, the good news for you is that HMRC are happy to discuss with you time to pay arrangements on a month by month basis because it's important to know that import VAT and import entries are not covered by this automatic, automatic VAT re return deferral scheme. So again, if you have a duty deferment account, please do call customs. They don't want you to um, cancel your direct debit. So you really must contact them well in advance of the direct debit being taken. 
So um, really for anything in April, you need to be contacting them now to ask for time to pay for that import VAT. This only applies to businesses with duty deferment accounts. It doesn't apply to businesses who use an agent to import their goods. So really that is a commercial conversation, unfortunately, with your agent well in advance because you don't want your goods being tied up pre-customs clearance where they're going to incur penalties and charges for being stuck on the port. Um, PAYE, just to recap that again, HMRC, it's not covered by the automatic um, deferral until next March 2021. So important to speak to them before your due date of your PAYE submission to arrange time to pay. We found them to be very helpful at agreeing an automatic three month deferral. Um, on that note, I'll hand back to Nigel. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Alison, and um, uh, and thank you to to Greg as well for your uh, for your update. Um, I was just going to uh, just cover off um, a question that, that's come in um, that uh, that might just be worth dealing with online. Um, so the question is: Can we recover the employers' and I pension contributions if the job retention scheme payment? Uh, is under two and a half thousand per, per month per employee. So the short answer is yes. Um, you're allowed to claim the the gross, uh, whether that's the eighty percent is capped or not capped at the two and a half thousand, plus the national insurance on that furloughed gross amount, plus the three percent employers uh, pension contribution on that on that uh, that furloughed amount. Um, clearly, you can pay top up payments, but they won't form part of your furlough grant claim. But to the extent you're putting through the gross pay, whether that's ca uh, capped at the 80% or capped at the 2,500, that plus the national insurance on that, plus the uh, employer's statutory pension on that, is what you can reclaim. What you can't reclaim, I'm afraid, um, is the apprenticeship levy. So that, that's still something you're going to need to pay for um, uh, as an employer yourself, that half a percent is something that will still be due um, and you can't reclaim that back. Um, the, uh, somebody needs to be uh, furloughed for at least three weeks. So clearly if you've given them notice already that that was perhaps for less than three weeks, change that notice to make sure it is three weeks uh, and that will be fine. Um, so just, just notify them again. Um, obviously uh, Alison's covered uh, had the interaction, I suppose, with uh, deferral of any PAYE tax and IC liabilities that are due on these amounts that, that are covered. So that's a deferral situation, um, and I think that that covers the uh, the question that that came in. Um, just wondering from the panelists, are there any uh, are there any other things we we haven't covered uh, that you wanted to sort of chip in and, and cover off now before we um, before we close the webinar? Take that silence as a no. Um, so, uh, so, so, thank you, everybody. Thank you for for attending. Um, I hope you appreciate that. This was always going to be a shorter. These are these are updates, uh, and we plan to do further updates, um, and, and obviously to cover what's changed from from the last uh, from the last webinar. These webinars are recorded, so they are available after the event. So, the first webinar that we did is is available, and the recording for this webinar will be available as soon as we can. Um, so, look out for that. Uh, which is likely to be uh, sometime tomorrow now. Um, but anyway, thank you all for uh, for participating, uh, and thank you to the to the panelists for their updates. Thank you. <laughs>